welcome everyone again to Ask Not What Evergreen Can Do For You. Oh, and Elizabeth, I apologize. I am going to add you to our speaker panel here. Elizabeth Thompson, Jennifer Weston, Jessica Wolford, Rogan Hamby, Taryn McKenna, and Tiffany Little will be talking with us today. So thanks again to our sponsors. And I will put that uh, link in the chat again for the captioning. If anyone does have questions, please go ahead and put them in the chat. And then I will try to monitor those as we go along. And now without further ado, I will hang it off to our presenters. Um, I will say just very quickly, the motivation behind this presentation was to have something to tell people, here are places you can jump into the community. <clears throat> and if you didn't know how to get involved, hopefully you'll find a home in one of these groups. So our first slide coming up is just a link to the place on our website where you can go to find out a lot of information about the communities. Uh, these slides are going to end up on YouTube uh, as well as on the website. So with that, we're just going to go group by group and start off with acquisitions. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, if you don't already know me, my name is Tiffany Little. I'm the acquisition specialist for Georgia Pines. Um, and I'm also the interest group coordinator for the Evergreen Acquisitions Group. Uh, interest group, rather. So um, I have a, a blurb, if you'll skip to the next slide. Thank you. Um, so the um, acquisitions interest group is, um, it's a meeting group, not a meeting, um, but it is intended for pretty much anyone who is interested in acquisitions, who uses it, who um, administers it, like a sysadmin, Pretty much if you're touch it at all in your in your work, um, you are most welcome. So um, pretty much the format that we use for our monthly meetings is we try and come up with just a topic for discussion for that particular meeting, um, which people can put forward as a topic that they want to talk about. Like I think our last one was about fiscal year end because that's coming up. So uh, it just changes every month. Um, and then at the end of each meeting, there's time reserved for basically just like an open mic kind of thing. So if you have any um, questions that you don't want to ask the listserv or just that you want to have more of a, I guess, a full uh, discussion about rather than going back and forth um, in email. So there's always time reserved for that at the end of the, the meeting. So um, and we do have a page on the Evergreen Wiki, so I've linked it there. So if you are interested, um, you can find more information there. In cataloging, that would be me. So the cataloging working group is much like the acquisitions group. We meet monthly online. We were created to share information about cataloging workflows in Evergreen, but we're also doing a little more than that. We've, we've branched into reviewing development as it's happening. And that's really been exciting because we get to see the work before it's actually released, thanks to the relationship we've built with the developers. Over time, we get um, at times we invite guests into our meetings so that they can come and demo work to us and we can provide our feedback instantly as a group to do that. So those are some of the, the more exciting um, monthly calls that we'll have. Outside of those, we do look at new releases and we talk about ongoing development related to cataloging. And during that, we'll highlight any existing launchpad bugs or maybe even identify some new ones that we need to submit. And we'll do that as a group to make sure that we're talking about desired functionality. We'll also, from time to time, do many trainings, uh, presentations either on new features or on things that just people aren't using very often. We do share our shared experiences and we'll talk uh, well we have time in each meeting to ask questions about how other how others do that we do have a very robust organizing committee there are 12 of us now who help put together these monthly uh, calls and then we actually do some um, kind of neat stuff with some of their interest groups too and so that's kind of it like um, the other working groups we do have a page on the wiki that we update pretty regularly and all of the recordings from our previous meetings and our notes from those are available there along with some really great resources for catalogers back to new devs so um I've been 
started the new devs uh, working group. I, the last time we met in person at a conference, which was the year before last, um, and we are a kind of a support group, and I think of it personally as an emotional support group for people who are new to evergreen development. Um, most of us, uh, including me, are not really developers with a capital D. Um, we have some experience doing some bits of code here and there, and we are, and it's not our primary focus in our jobs but we want to learn enough so that we can contribute you know local customizations or bug fixes or any um, you know small pieces that we can and we also um, welcome people who are real developers but who are new to evergreen and want to kind of get their bearings and figure out where code lives, uh, why there's so many different kinds of code in Evergreen, <laughs> and how all of the different kinds of code work together. Um, so sometimes we uh, we will have guests come in and talk about a specific topic, such as setting up a, um, a test server for doing local testing, uh, or doing a particular piece of code. Um, and we do record those sessions when we can, and those are available on our wiki page. Um, and sometimes we just work on either testing um, potential bug fixes as a group and kind of looking at what the bug, the actual code of the bug fix and what it does. And sometimes we'll just pick a bug and work on it together. Those sessions um, is a lot of us just kind of staring at code and <laughs> brainstorming possible solutions. Um, so it varies a lot, um, but we are just there to support each other and we welcome anyone to come. Thank you. All right, let's go ahead and jump forward to the next slide. This is Outreach. Outreach is the group that I am the head of I say head in quotation marks because I sort of envision outreach as an umbrella. So for example, outreach is a group that has been helping to put on the 2021 online conference, but I'm certainly not the head of that. Andrea has uh, kindly taken up the mantle and headed that up. So we have different projects that go on in outreach that different people really take the lead on. Uh, I'm just responsible for writing up a monthly thing for the board and keeping the schedule going. Now, with that said, we do meet once a month. That's the first Wednesday of each month. Uh, I have links on the slides here for the wiki and for our mailing list. You can find a bunch of information on the wiki about things we're doing. I sometimes jokingly refer to us as the working group for English majors and artists in the Evergreen community. Uh, that's certainly not entirely true. For example, DIG has a lot of use for the English majors uh, in the community. And I'm an English major, by the way, that's my undergrad degree. Um, but we look at communication. We're not a crunchy group. We're not doing code. We're not looking at the specific functionality areas and everything that much. Instead, we look at communication issues, both internal and external to our community. So for example, we worked on a wiki cleanup earlier uh, in this cycle, I was about to say earlier this year, but it was really late last year and we have more we need to do on it. Uh, but that is an example of a communication project internal to the community. The online conference is an aspect of that. However, we also do things like the annual report. The 2020 annual report will be coming out tomorrow. And that is both internal and external because we do see it both as something that can be shared internal to the community but also share it externally to let people know what we're doing. And then things like social media, YouTube content, all these things. So if anyone's interested in joining outreach and getting to work on any of these kinds of things, feel free to join us. All right, and I will pass it on to reports. Hi, I'm Jessica. Oop, I'm not sure that my, can you hear me? I. I, we, we heard I am Jessica Oops, which I don't think is actually your name. <laughs> How about now? Yep, can hear you fine. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so I, I, it's weird. I see like my, my microphone is uh, is chopped off, but I 
had myself unmuted. Anyhow, um, so the I'm Jessica Wolford. Uh, I am the Evergreen Systems Manager at Billy Mation, and um, the I lead the reports interest group uh, along with a couple of of uh, motley folks who uh, are an organizing committee that sort of helped me plan out these meetings. Uh, that would be Lynn Floyd and Joe Newvin. Joe, if I've pronounced your name incorrectly, I apologize. <laughs> um, so uh, we work on wrangling the beast that is uh, the reports module in Evergreen. Uh, in Rogan's pre-conference um, program, he referred to it as, cl as uh, clowns and spiders. Um, and uh, so if you've ever looked at it, you know that it's very, very powerful, but not always very user friendly. Um, and so we also need, those of us who work with reports, in an emotional support environment where we can sort of gather together and, and talk about reports and figure out how we can um, use this monster a little bit better. Um, and uh, the the reports working group has a as a or interest group has a long history in the evergreen community. Just kind of as a as a side note, um, it started off as the reports task group, um, as in an effort to. Did we lose Jessica? Okay, is audio back for anybody? Okay. Got great. Let's, we just uh, lost Jessica. Yeah, let's go ahead and move on with student success while we wait to see if Jessica can reconnect. Sounds good. Uh, hi, this is Elizabeth Thompson. I'm uh, managing the student success group. Uh, can we move to the next slide? Uh, good, because I need to remember what we do. Um, the student success group, it looks at ways that the Evergreen system can be used and improved to help students achieve their learning goals. Um, and we welcome everybody who has an interest in this. So that includes staff of academic libraries, um, school libraries at, at all levels, um, and public libraries who serve um, students as members of the public and, of course, consortia staff. Um, we're one of the groups that does not look at a particular function like circulation or, or reports in the system, but we look across the system at all the different aspects that um, in, in light of the needs of uh, students. Um, we have a an email list that we encourage you to subscribe to. Um, the link there, and I'll also post it in the chat, uh, will take you to the subscription page. And we have a wiki, um, which we're in the process of updating, that has um, links to our meeting agendas and to recorded meetings and also uh, projects, ideas, and things that we're um, looking into. And we've been on a bit of a hiatus during the past academic year, um, but we will be um, setting up bi-monthly meetings uh, soon. And that's it. Round table. All right, that went quickly. Uh, so we have a few round table questions and people are welcome to answer these in as much depth as they want, given that we have 37 minutes left. Uh, and the first one I think is a pretty easy one for all of us, because I think we all do a lot, but how does your group help support the larger community? in any particular order, Rogan? 
I want a death match. I want you to fight uh, <laughs> with knives and batons over who talks first. But Can we, we divide fight. into teams? <laughs> It'd be interesting to see who teamed up with each. But, you know, in the interest of uh, legal liability, we should probably keep it just to asking, no, do you want to go first? Um, but, but any order is fine. I heard somebody take an intake breath, but I'll, if they're that, not going to talk, I'll <laughs> well, that, was, that was me to say something about the cataloging working group, which I'm also a member of. Um, but I, I really think that that uh, that group has organized in a way that that the rest of us groups might might be inspired by. Uh, and I particularly like the way that um, we've been having representatives of other interest groups come to the cataloging interest group and um, talk about how they organize things and also common areas of interest. There's obviously a lot of areas of commonality between acquisitions and cataloging, but um, it's been very interesting um, having guest speakers uh, be introduced from the other um, interest groups and also um, celebrating milestones in the community or other kinds of um, honors or successes or, or whatever. So I really think that group um, under Jennifer has, has done a lot to um, look outside their own group and, and uh, kind of integrate integrate everything with the rest of uh, the larger community. Yeah, Elizabeth, I was just thinking the exact same thing. When I was looking at this panel, I'm thinking everybody on this panel has been to the cataloging working group <laughs> meetings at some point over the, the last year. So thank you all because everybody's so willing to do that. It's just a matter of reaching out and, and extending an invitation. So yeah, I would just echo everything Elizabeth said. That's what we're doing. <laughs> that that and we're talking to developers more in a positive manner as opposed to just well, I shouldn't say that quite that way. But that I, I love that we're being able to um, participate more thanks to Taryn's organizing the the bug squashing week and even the feedback fest. Catalogers are able to do that now in a way that they really haven't been able to before because you've made it so very accessible. So that's one way that we're able to actually get in and do some testing, and provide feedback on bugs before and after you know they're released. So you know, we'd like to send a big thanks to Taryn for that too. And some of these groups are handling traditional challenges. And you know, because somebody has stepped forward and said, okay, I'll pick up the baton and try to provide some organizing here. And I'll pick on Taryn a little bit. Uh, Evergreen is not an easy system to do development for. It has a lot of different moving pieces. Uh, it, it has been written by a lot of people who are very strong in their technical skills. And there is a fair amount of threshold to pass to do development. And for many years, people have said, you know, I want to do development. I want to program. And that interest has come both from very technical people new to the community, as well as, as Taryn said earlier, people who their primary responsibilities are not on the server side, but they want to find ways to contribute. And her new developer working group uh, uh, has taken up that challenge of trying to help her provide, as she says, emotional support between them. Um, and, and I don't think we should laugh too much. I mean, it's okay to laugh a little bit at it. but It's, it's true. <laughs> but it's true, right. I mean, it, it, anybody who has never looked at something and gone, how the blank does this work, um, has never tried to learn highly technical things. <laughs> and, and it's like, and when, and when you're new to the community, um, you know, you can get into IRC and talk to the developers that are hanging out there or go to a hackaway or something and sit in the room with the people that do this major development. And once you get to know them, they're all very approachable, but in the beginning, it's incredibly intimidating. Um, so you know we're kind of a safe space <laughs> <You know? laughs> sometimes we do have a, a, a you know a higher level developer come in and do a talk or something but for the most part we're just kind of muddling through and figuring things out together um well and i think uh, there's but, a, with, with a goal of all learning more but yeah and and i think there is a necessary space to provide some of that uh precursor information i mean it's one thing to go to an experienced developer and say well, how do I do this? Where do I go? And if they turn around and say, well, go to the actor API and, you know, look at the value where it's parsed as is bull, 
And if that's all gibberish to you, <laughs> um, it's good to have people you can go to and say, okay, when they say the actor API, what does that mean? And we may not know, <laughs> but we will work on figuring it out. Um, yeah, it's so um, one of the things that if you go to the new developers wiki, um, we have started um, kind of a simple outline of all of the different types of code and technologies that are used in Evergreen um, because, you know, it started out in one type of code and well, a few a combination of a few types of code. Um, but then over the years, you know, it was upgraded from a an installed client to a web client and the initial version of software or, or the scripting language that the web client was initially developed in uh, got deprecated in favor of a different kind. Um, that had very, that, you know, we didn't really have any control over <laughs> the language itself stopped being supported in favor of something else. So um, there are a lot of different types of code going on in different places. Um, and it's, it's, you know, often hard to even figure out which type of code you're looking at. So we try to help with that. Do a great job. Um... And I, I'm going to brag on Outreach a little bit. Outreach is a group that was formed by Kathy Lucier and myself a number of years ago. And the motivation behind it in part was we were walking around ALA one year and picking up this documentation from commercial ILSs that was very slick. And I'm not going to name names, but we were looking at one where we said, man, if you read this stuff, you'd think they were the best thing on earth. And we happened to know they weren't very good at all. <laughs> and we said, why don't we brag about ourselves more, both internally and externally? Um, it will value in doing that. So that's what outreach tries to do. And I, th I think we do benefit the community in that regard. I've heard people say, for example, that they've been able to take, you know, our annual report and hand it to people and say, well, you know, look, this is stuff happening in an easily summarized form. I guess so. So when I read this, the the thing there was this question. The thing that I thought was um, so. I think that the acquisitions interest group has been had like a space, you know, a table at the conference for a long time. Um, but I think as most things in the community, it had sort of like an ebb and flow of like meeting. Other than that, um, so when I started my position. Um, I just really wanted to talk about it with someone again, coming up with the, um, I needed some emotional support. <laughs> so, um, I appreciate, and I hope other people appreciate that having a space that's carved out every month that we can just talk about acquisition stuff. Um, and so it's not just once a year at the conference because it, once a year at the conference, I'm all, you know, we always leave, we're excited. We're like, Oh, we're going to get all this stuff done. And then, you know, things come up in your regular job and you you sort of lose that momentum. So um, so I, I think the good thing about having an interest group meeting every month um, is just sort of being able to keep that momentum going throughout the year. And I think Tiffany hit on something that I think we can all agree with it. It's about talking to somebody else about what we do. We've got a big job outside of what we do regularly, but being able to just focus for even if it's just one hour a month throughout the year can, can really mean the difference of keeping the momentum going. Yeah, I think we can all agree with that. Absolutely. Are we ready for the next question? I think so. Nobody seems jumping to chew more on this one. So let's move on to fresh meat. Jessica may have something. She's back with us. Yay. Hello? Oh, <laughs> I just got in. So uh, go ahead and go move on to the next question. <laughs> All right. Uh, our second question for the round table is, how does your group provide opportunities for new community members to become engaged? This is your chance to stump and tell people, come join us. 
Who wants to go first? Come join us. The Cataloging Working Group meets on the <laughs> second Tuesday of every month online. Look for on the Evergreen <laughs> Listserv and the Cataloging Listserv. Or email me directly. I'll tell you when the meeting is. And Jennifer is very organized. She, <laughs> she's very good at that. Yeah, we, we take anybody like, uh, you know, you don't have to be like a lot of us are people who work at consortium and build reports for end users. But um, if you're a person who runs reports, if you're a, per if you're a, a um, librarian who's building your own reports, uh, please come. We, we will take anybody. Um, and uh, I think anybody has... Uh, the opportunity to to learn uh, from from other people in the community. I've been doing reports for ten years. I learn something at every meeting that we that we have. And I will say for outreach, one of the great opportunities about outreach is that because we are not uh, specific to a functional area, um, I, I'm sure people will join reports. For example, I'll pick on Jessica here who initially at least say, oh, you know, I don't know that much about reports. I don't know. I don't have that much to contribute. And if you think that, I hope you join the reports group and at least listen until you feel comfortable participating. I, I hope that's true of any of these groups. But the outreach group, we don't have any barrier like that. If you can proofread English, you can proofread a press release. If you can, you know, look at something and say that looks good, then you can help, you know, proof layouts. Um, because we're a communication group, the barrier to entry is extremely low. But it's really low with all of us. But uh, I, I think it's more obviously low with outreach in some ways. But I would uh, encourage people to join any of these groups. And if you need to, be a wallflower until you feel comfortable participating. Well, I think that with student success, what I need to do is um, provide opportunity, provide discussion and questions and engage some people just over email and then hope that, of course, causes them to, you know, want to come to, to meetings. Um, you know, it's some people find it uncomfortable to go to a new group meeting, whether that meeting is in person or online. Sometimes it's even worse online because you have to look at your own face you know, all, all, all of that. You don't really know how many people are there and if you're going to be called on or whatever. I mean, that's, that's, it's just difficult to go to your first meeting for something. Um, so I think that in, in terms at least of, of my group that doesn't have enough of an established base, I need to engage people by email. First of all, I need to engage people elsewhere to join the email list and then, you know, try to, try to uh, give them a way to participate by answering questions or making suggestions um, about specific issues and kind of kind of warm them up that way and, and hope they start coming to meetings. And, and I think method of engagement is an excellent uh, thing to pick out historically, and I'm not recently, but long ago, it was the habit that most evergreen groups met in IRC, which I think provided a bit of a barrier to quite a number of people to participating. And in the last three, four years, however long it's been, most of the groups have migrated to some sort of other platform. For example, Outreach uses Google Meetings. And you're welcome to leave your webcam off if you want, and we can treat it, and we treat it as a sort of group phone call. Um, but it may, but it means all you have to do is click a web link to enter. And I know uh, cataloging is using GoTo as a platform. And what about the rest of folks? I think most people are using some sort of uh, AV meeting platform, aren't you? Um, the new devs usually uses Google Meet, um, be, both because we are usually screen sharing and because um, we have the record capability with our license. And so we can record when we have special guests. And it's been working out really well, makes it really easy for people. Yeah, same here. We use Google Meet, rather. Google Meet, Google Meet. And, and several groups are recording sessions, and some of them are posting on YouTube, some on other platforms. If anybody is posting videos somewhere other than the YouTube channel, though, 
I'd request that you send copies to us at Outreach because we would love to put them on the YouTube channel to make people, uh, uh, to enable it for people to find the content as easily as possible. Reminder, um, I have not been sending you the ones that we've posted, um, so I will do that. And if you're more comfortable uploading them yourself on your own schedule, we can probably get you access to the YouTube channel. Um, at some point, we may have to look at setting up a new YouTube channel, but that's another issue. Our, our, our current owner of the channel is no longer in the Evergreen community, though I believe his heart is still with us. Um, so <laughs> he's still happy to add people for us when we ping him. Um, <laughs> and Debbie points out that Dig is meeting on Zoom every other month. Um, do we have anything additional we want to do on this question, or do we want to move on? Let's move on. Oh, I'll add one thing real quick, and then we can move on. Um, what I was going to say is, um, as far as getting new people to become engaged, so I think everybody knows that acquisitions is kind of a own thing like its own beast <laughs> um and so if someone is starting to use acquisitions for the first time they can read all the documentation they want no matter how good it is and just sometimes be lost so just having um a group where you can log in and be like you guys i, I don't understand um and just have someone be like oh it means this um i think that's uh, a good uh, resource to have for new members in the community, just having yeah. people there. Absolutely. And, and I will tell you, when I did acquisitions uh, at a library, when I was still doing purchasing for adult collections, uh, before my current uh, internet, uh, I didn't even know where to start with Evergreen Acquisitions, and I didn't use it as a result. I, it was before the acquisitions interest group existed, and I just decided to use Excel and track my stuff. <laughs> and if the app group had existed at that time, I would have loved joining it to ask questions and get ideas from everybody about good workflows. Okay, next question. All right, what would you say is your, is your advice to someone entirely new to Evergreen and maybe even new to open source communities in general? I know it's a big question. Everybody's sort of sitting there with the pondering <laughs> look of, wow, where do I start on this? I think from, um you know, thinking mostly about um, bug squashing week and that sort of thing. Um, and we haven't talked much about the documentation interest group, but that's another uh, interest group that's very um, active. Um, but I think that a lot of people, um, even experienced people in the Evergreen community, uh, underestimate their ability to contribute. Um, you know, there are things like Rogan was saying with the outreach and with documentation where you don't have to have a lot of technical skill to contribute. Um, but I think also for things like um, Bug Squashing Week, where we set up test servers with bugs applied, um, we invite all experienced Evergreen users, you know, people that know how the software should work or, you know, how it how workflows need to happen, um, what kind of things need to happen to solve a problem in the actual day-to-day -day frontline environment. Um, you know, people that are experts in circulation and in cataloging and in, um, you know, even in reference and, you know, people that teach patrons how to use the OPEC. All of these people, whether you have any kind of code background or not, your feedback is incredibly valuable for testing. Um, so when we set up a test server with a patch applied, you know, we invite everyone to come in and look at those patches and see what the changes are and see if they're solving the problem that's been reported. Um, so I, I think uh, my advice in general to 
rephrase would <laughs> would just be to, you know, don't underestimate uh, your value to the community overall. I, I think that's a great thing to point out. And I, I always try to point out to people the lack of decentralization and that it is important for a reason, uh, which to give some context for, I'll share a little story. I'm not going to name names, but some of you out there will guess the entities I'm about to mention, talk about. Uh, before coming to Evergreen, I was at a public library using a commercial ILS, proprietary ILS, that had been very popular for many years, and we actually really liked it. But the company that originally created and supported it was bought out by another company. The user community around the original product was very strong. Uh, I remember every day logging into email, seeing supportive messages on listservs, people asking questions. There were repositories for scripts to run that people made. Uh, and, and it was a wonderful community. And one day, the new owners of that ILS, which had another product they wanted to push, decide, obviously decided that that community supporting the other product was not beneficial to their bottom line. And they used their legal powers to squash the repositories and to shut down people communicating about the product. And then the value of this ILS to us, frankly, went way, way down. And we were on Evergreen in less than 18 months. Um, and community is powerful. Uh, and community has value. And that's true with any product. Uh, the difference here is nobody can take that away because nobody owns the any aspect of the community as an intellectual property. So jump in and just bask in it. <laughs> um, so I, I'm gonna I'm gonna speak for the social anxiety people and say um, don't be afraid to lurk for a little bit, which is what I did because when I first started, you know, Pine supports most of the state of Georgia. So I was like, oh my gosh, if we run Evergreen, this must be a huge community of people. They're all gonna think I'm dumb, like that I don't know what I'm talking about. And so if you, you know, join a couple of listservs, you don't have to add all of them or anything, you start to notice that it's, it's not, it's a pretty small community. And like you go to the conference and you're like, oh, this isn't like some huge thing and everybody's really nice. So uh, I think I am, I'm very much a get in the lay of the land kind of person. Um, so that was what worked for me that I just sort of saw that this was a welcoming, you know, place to participate and then i felt more comfortable participating after i sort of i guess got the lay of the land that's the, the word i guess i'll use but so that's mine isn't as inspiring uh as everybody else's but that's what worked for me <laughs> uh no i think for the introverts in the crowd um and let's do a quick raise of hands who here is an introvert Not quite as many as I thought. Um, that That's useful advice. Uh, I've been talking a good chunk of today. And I'm going to go ahead and tell you, I'm going to be in an energy-deprived coma after I log out from work, um, even though I'm not in physical presence of other people. So I, I think that's important, Tiffany. Thank you. I think so, too. Um, I One of the things that, that I struggle with is... Um, I, this, there's great value in recording these sessions, um, you know, interest group meetings, all of these things, and sharing them. That makes it more accessible to people who can't be at any particular thing at 2 p.m. and all that kind of stuff. Um, but I, I do think that makes it harder for the social anxiety people or the people who are specifically uncomfortable in this area or that area because it's their new job or whatever and they don't know people. So, I mean, I think there's there's a lot to be said for the safe space, but then when the safe space is recorded and put on YouTube, <laughs> it's sort of maybe feels a little less safe to some people. Um, you know, so I, I um, and this is, I, I struggle with this at my own job and in other 
organizations I'm part of, like how do you balance the value of recording and sharing everything versus the, you know, does that discourage a lot of people asking their stupid questions or revealing that they didn't understand how something worked or yeah. all that? And different groups have to come to different decisions. Um, I mean, for I, I understand, for example, New Devs records theirs and they have a lot of functional information that's valuable oh, to share. Well, we only record the ones where we have guest speakers, though. <laughs> we, don't oh, record, interesting. we don't record the ones where we're just looking at code together. <laughs> I, I think it's probably smart. And outreach doesn't do anything that's really instructional in nature, so we don't record out. We don't record acts because, I mean, it's mostly just us either answering someone's question or just talking amongst ourselves. Yeah. So it, it's not anything. We don't have like an agenda, like a, a specific instructional kind of thing, usually. And yeah, we've talked about that. It's, it's not really off fun yet about having separate sessions called like ask a cataloger kind of sessions where we can just ask anything we've done one of those to where we wouldn't record them but it would just be anybody can show up and ask questions anytime so i really want to try to revive that this year and see if we can even if it's just at the end of our regular meetings to have time to turn off the cameras and the recording to do that but we've got to find a, a different kind of venue because the there's value in recording them if you can't make them, but what Elizabeth says is so true. I mean, it is a deterrent for some for participating if you know it's going to be put out there for, for everybody. Well, and I've been at meetings, none of your meetings, <laughs> but I mean, I've, I've been at meetings where um, people are speaking freely and sometimes a little too freely, you know, when you, um, when you think about how the thing they said about their library or their boss or their predecessor or whatever, you know, will come across recorded or, you know, whatever. This is why I like notes, meeting notes, because they're, <laughs> they're sort of edited as you go along, you know. Um, but it's a, I, I just think it's a difficult situation for, to balance out. I can say that one of the ways I became more comfortable in the community following up on that is because I, I learned for probably two years, I think, before I interacted with anybody outside of my own library consortium. Um, it, so, you know, I needed to get really comfortable. But is that even after that, I would watch the listservs and some of these interest groups that I've just kind of lurk around in and find somebody that was talking about something that I need, I wanted to know more about. And then I would just contact them all well by email instead. And that meant built some really great relationships that way but i was much more comfortable saying hey maybe if i just email them and ask my question later they'll answer me and they did so it was a wonderful way to to not only just start interacting but to start feeling more comfortable because then you know a few people that are on these listservs and and in and on these calls and the interest group meetings Yeah, and I think it's fine to contact people directly and say, hey, you know, can you answer this question for me? Uh, I, you know, I, and I think most people are going to intuitively understand maybe they don't feel comfortable asking this question in public and be fine with that. Um, I was talking well, I to some... When some yep. Go ahead. Well, I find that when somebody asks me a question personally, I see that you're doing this, how does this work, you know, all that, I, I actually feel more comfortable answering them than I would feel on a large list of people who some of them are going to say you should never do it that way you should do it this way or that way or whatever you know and I when it's when it's one-on-one -on -one, you're talking about your situation to their situation and it can be more specific and more personal and you know more contextual than than uh, discussions on on the list so I, I think that's a, a, a good strategy um, and that there's sometimes when that's the best strategy. And I just want to encourage people to ask questions. What, where, whatever form you find comfortable. Um, I was discussing this with someone the other day and, uh, you know, they said something to the effect of, well, are you of the adage that there's no, there are no stupid questions? I said, no, of course there are stupid questions. The thing is, we all ask stupid questions sometimes. If you don't ask a few, then if a few stupid questions don't slip through, you're probably not asking enough questions. I find that librarians are more comfortable answering questions 
they're more comfortable sitting, you know, with a big sign that says information and you're, right. you know, you're being the helpful person. And I, you know, I find that a lot of librarians have a hard time asking questions because they feel they ought to have the research skills to look it up themselves or they're, they're just, it's like role reversal and they're, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's uncomfortable. That's and, an excellent point. I've never thought about it that way, but you're absolutely yeah. right. When people call me with a question and, and, you know, do a whole preliminary, I know I should have looked this up and I'm sure you already explained it to us or, or whatever, I'll stop them sometimes and say, is that what you say to a patron when they like when a patron comes right. up to the desk? Do they need to apologize to you for, you know, asking a question? Don't don't apologize. Just yeah. you know, I'm sitting here with an information sign over my head. And I think we do pretty well at that as a community of being welcoming of questions. Um, but we should always be vigilant at looking at ourselves and seeing if there are ways we can be better. And Brad in chat said vulnerability is a skill. I think that's true. Absolutely. I, think, I, th I, I mean, it's something that I know I've struggled with in the past. I mean, feeling comfortable asking a question that you know is very basic to somebody else, but you really need to ask it. And it's something that we have to learn to be comfortable doing. And it's really hard. And they don't teach you that in school, bizarrely. <laughs> you think that'd be like the first thing they teach you in schools. All right, we are at the five or well, four minute mark uh, to the end of the session. Uh, any questions from chat? Any additional points people want to make? Uh, people are welcome to juggle if they wish. I won't because I'd injure myself. Um, Well, before we leave, I'll just say people are welcome to send me any questions they want, even if it's a stupid question. I won't tell you it's stupid, <laughs> um, and I'll be still glad you asked it, and just ask that if I ask you a stupid question in the future, and I probably will, um, just be kind to me when I do it. <laughs> I noticed uh, I'm reading through chat, and there was quite a few comments about IRC being intimidating, and you know, and and. You know, I, I tend to agree. Um, uh, every once in a while, um, unfortunately, uh, Yamil used to be in the Evergreen community, and he used to do a great little intro to IRC session. Um, but he has moved on to other another role. Um, but uh, it actually looks like the Evergreen community might be moving away from IRC. There is some. Uh, political <laughs> um, issues going on with the management. So, um, so it, yeah, yeah other, I'll, I'll say we're probably going to still be on IRC, but through um, a different a, uh, service, a different server. Yeah. yeah. Uh, without getting into details, there is a, a coup d'etat occurring on the server service we've been using, but there are alternatives. Yeah. Um, it, and I, I agree, it is a little bit uh, intimidating, um, especially, you know, the fact that it's publicly logged is excellent if you're trying to find an old conversation, but it's also very intimidating because everything you write in there is recorded <laughs> in perpetuity. Uh, so, yeah, I agree. That can that. be valuable, though. I one day was looking for the answer to something that I could not figure out, and I searched through our IC logs, and it showed me the text with the answer before I saw who posted it. And I thought that was great. So I pulled up the full page so that I could thank the person. And it turned out it was myself from like two, <laughs> two years before. And I'd completely forgotten the answer. <laughs> um, this is Dawn. I was late to joining, but I just want to chime in for those of you that are not technical, that don't code, that don't, um, where you think everybody's speaking Greek around you at this conference. Um, that's me. I'm like that, but I have also learned that um, what I can put in is worth it. It does help, and so don't be afraid to to just say, "Hey, what can I do?" And somebody will tell you what you can do. So don't for, don't be afraid just because you don't code, because I don't, and almost everything that's said is over my head. But that's okay. I'll get there. <laughs> somebody will explain it to me. <laughs> 
And it was Greek to everybody at some point. Right. And Don is, for those of you that don't know Don, Don is um, the Pine Circulation Specialist uh, who, you know, does circulation support for 300 libraries. And so she is definitely one of the people <laughs> that that is absolutely relied upon to test circulation bug fixes. And we find a lot of the bugs, too. That's the other thing is those of us that use it every day find a lot of the bugs and I've learned how to report bugs and I'll usually get somebody to check to make sure it's really a bug, but I've learned how to report them and that also helps very much. I saw someone in chat um, and I'm sorry I missed your name. They said something like, um, I should already know this and I it caught my eye because I have totally thought that to myself. Um, but there's nothing that you're you should already know, you know, everybody is at different stages of learning their job or their specialty or whatever. So I, I, I know that that feeling, but you should never, you should never be afraid to ask. Yeah, and that goes back to that vulnerability as a skill. It's okay. It, it's and it's easier to say it's okay to ask than it actually is to ask at times. But if you keep doing it, it gets a little bit easier each time. But it can be really scary. We all know that. And still get in that spot. <laughs> sure. I'm not going to back up now, but were our emails on that first slide with their names? I was going to say that would be a good way to reach any of us. I well, I back that first slide didn't have our emails, uh, but it did point to the website. So whatever okay. contact information is on the website is there. And I think most of us have emails there. Mm -hmm. I think so, too. I forgot. So, if not, we can go in and add it. <laughs> OK, well, thank you for joining us. Everybody, it was great. Thanks for all you all do. I enjoyed reading all the side chat. Yeah, they, it, this was particularly <laughs> interesting. Uh, chat going on. <laughs> Thanks so much to all of our presenters. I really appreciate it. Uh, those of you who are sticking with track one, feel free to hang out for a few minutes. And I think some of our presenters are with us <laughs> in the next session anyway, so it's perfect. Uh, and those of you who are on to track two, we will see you later today or tomorrow.